there is a popular saying in leadership that if you think you are leading and there is nobody following you, you are only going on their walk. On this platform, you are going to learn principles of leadership. You are going to encounter different leaders. You are going to learn about how you can grow as a leader, how you can make an impact. My name is Samuel Ayim and I'm the host for the leadership platform. I am a leadership coach, a lawyer by profession, a John C. Maxwell certified coach. I have been in corporate life in senior positions for several years and now I run the Center for Transformational Leadership where we train and coach leaders to become better leaders. And I invite you to go on a journey with us as we discuss the subject of leadership in the coming weeks. This and every Saturday, you have opportunity to ask questions, share your views on important leadership matters. My name is Eliza. My name is Elsie. My name is Sibiniza Tufo. This is Rosemary Nobagesi. Over the past 14 weeks, I have been part of CTL Africa's 15 week growth journey, and it has been a blessing for me. I want to share my lessons with you. Indeed, my attitude to life has never been the same. From the very first day I joined the virtual personal growth and leadership masterclass organized by Center for Transformational Leadership City in Africa under the tutelage of Mr. Samuel Yu. First, the law of intentionality. Second, the law of design. And third, the law of the rubber band, the law of expansion. The law of intentionality, the law of awareness. Then we have the law of the mirror. Looking at how intense these laws are and how much impact they're supposed to make to our life. My value obviously is not the same. The program indeed satisfies my quest for knowledge. So I encourage you to be part of this journey and also become an encouragement to others. I will recommend the CTL Africa to everyone who hears about us. It has been a blessing to me and I will encourage you to be part of CTL Africa's 15 week group journey. So we thank Mr. Yim, we thank CTL, and thank you for uh, uh, listening to us. God bless you as you make a move today. I have been blessed and so you will blessed. Thank you. Hi, dear friend. My name is Samuel Ayim, and I'm the CEO for the Center for Transformational Leadership. And I'm bringing to you the growth journey. We've set aside 15 weeks of growth to help you to be intentional about your growth. Where do you want to reach in your leadership? Which area of your life do you want to grow in? Growth doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional. So in these 15 weeks, we're going to have a special coaching sessions with you to be able to grow to where you want to grow. And to be able to grow yourself, you need to know yourself. A lot of us are not achieving the maximum we can achieve because we have not invested in our personal growth. We're going to help you in all and more within these 15 weeks. Every week we'll have a session with you. This program is limited to only 15 people. We're going to have 15 people for 15 weeks and we're going to learn 15 great growth lessons on this journey. So make a date with us and see you on the growth journey.
Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Leadership Platform. My name is Samuel Ayim, and I'm excited this evening uh, to welcome all of you to the Leadership Platform. It is a great pleasure every Saturday evening to come your way with some ideas on leadership. It is a great pleasure to come your way with new There is a popular saying in leadership that if you think you're leading and there's nobody following you, you are only going on a walk. On this platform, you are going to learn principles of leadership. You are going to encounter different leaders. You are going to learn about how you can grow as a leader, how you can make an impact. My name is Samuel Ayim and I'm the host for the leadership platform. I am a leadership coach, a lawyer by profession, a John C. Maxwell certified coach. I have been in corporate life in senior positions for several years. And now I run the Center for Transformational Leadership where we train and coach leaders to become better leaders. And I invite you to Go on a journey with us as we discuss the subject of leadership in the coming weeks. This and every Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the leadership platform. And um, I trust that you are all ready for this amazing subject. It is our pleasure every Saturday evening to come your way with a new leader and a new topic, looking at different aspects of leadership. And for those of you who are interested to grow, we know that you are learning. We are going to be together for about one and a half hours and we will have our speaker speak to us for up to about 40 minutes. And then we'll have the rest of the time to exchange ideas, to answer your questions. And as I say all the time, we learn even more during the discussion and exchange sessions. So stay with us to the end, if you will, so that you can maximize your time with us. But for now, please introduce yourself because it is our pleasure to tell the world who is here on the leadership platform. So Conrad Kakraba is here and says this will be exceptional waiting with anticipation. Yes, that is the spirit because we all know the speaker. And Miss Abby is here. Miss Abby, welcome. I have John Derry. Uh, what is the cost of the training, John? Uh, for this training, the cost is free. And so please relax and enjoy yourself. You will not have a bill. Lakwe is here. He's looking forward to an insightful session. Ebenezer Tufo joins from Abuja. He says, good evening to everyone. Enes Hemingwe. Uh, Enes Enim, all right. Uh, okay, different names. Uh, is here. We have uh, Kellen's uh, Lyceum. Nai, I hope I pronounce it well. And Collins Mombebe from Pram Pram. All right. And NS Hemingway is here with us. All right. So those are the people who have introduced themselves. We know that many of you join and you don't introduce yourself. Please go ahead and introduce yourself because it is our pleasure to welcome all of you. I see William Darfour is here and I see. Frank is also here. All right. So I know Sarah is here. Abigail is here. Kofi is also connected. Thank you all guys for supporting me behind the scenes. And our speaker is here. This evening, we have a speaker who is no stranger on this platform. I think this is the third time he's been on this platform. And every time doctor is here, we learn great lessons in a special way. Doc has a special touch of teaching. And so we are privileged to have Dr. Yao Pebi with us this evening. Dr. Pebi is a physician, he's a pastor, 
and the president of the International Students Ministry Canada. He is a global CEO of the Hard Group, which is championing holistic leadership development in over 20 countries all over the six continents. As a medical doctor, he has practiced medicine in both Ghana as a military captain with the United Nations operations in Cote d'Ivoire. And for four years, he served as the English pastor of the Montreal Chinese Alliance Grace Church. Dr. Pebby, uh, Dr. Pebby, 15 books include Amazon bestseller, Thinking Outside the Window. He is physically served in 45 countries across the world and being the toast of the media groups worldwide, including CNN, National Press Club in Washington, VOA, CBC, BBC. Doc is very well demanded. We know the demand on his time, but he's made the time for us. Um, Doc is also a John C. Maxwell certified coach. He's a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative and the Aspen Global Leadership Network a Luzan movement for global catalyst and serve as he serves on various strategic boards also. Now, Doc is based in Canada and he would like us to know that he is based there with his beautiful wife, Anyele, Anyele, who is an economist and an entrepreneur and their six delightful children who are all homeschooled by Doc and his wife. He owes all this, he says, to Jesus Christ, and we say amen to that. And on that note, we have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Yaopebi to the leadership platform for the third time. Doc, you are very welcome. It is our pleasure having you once again. We love you, Doc. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. And uh, I love the team. love what the great work you're doing on the um, leadership platform. It's vital work. So thank you for persistently doing it uh, all, all these years. Do I go ahead and share now? Yes, Doc, you can go ahead. You can shoot. And uh, I think I will share your screen for you if yes, you want. Yes, I do. All right, Sarah. Great. So thank you again, uh, Sam, for inviting me to come and share these uh, thoughts. And uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you for the thank you to the whole team. Now, I'd like to start with this statement. We are talking about leading from your life story. Leading from your life story. And I'd like to start with this statement that leadership is serious business. Leadership is serious business. And I, I know that it seems like the loudest person gets the vote in many places, you know, in Africa, parliament, in parliament, people are exchanging blows and, you know, uh, politicians are taking this and stealing that. And, but leadership is not, it's, that's not leadership. Leadership is very serious business. And uh, the, the more I get into it, the more I find it's, it's, it's a sacred calling and it ought to be entered very, very carefully. When African Africans finally take leadership seriously, we'll see the fruits thereof. So kudos to Sam and the team for the great work that you are doing. Tonight, we're looking at leading from your life story. And I, I first, of course, want to bring you greetings from my family. Uh, this is a snapshot of the people in my home who... Uh, are my, on my social base and who are my first cohort of leadership. Uh, we have a family statement that in our home, our, our, our vision is that our home will be an incubator for forming godly, effectual leaders for the mission of God. That there's leadership everywhere. Our children talk about leadership. Our children can tell you the definition of leadership I'm about to give you. That a leader is a responsible person who serves and influences people to achieve a shared noble purpose. Now, 
I'm beginning with this favorite definition of mine. I've tweeted this definition from various places and various sources. Uh, after studying quite a number of the 360 definitions that they are of leadership, I actually have a master's in leadership. I'll be graduating next week in California, uh, Master of Arts degree in global leadership. A leader is a responsible person who serves and influences other people to achieve a shared noble purpose. Now, uh, uh, take note of this definition. Of course, context matters very much in leadership. Uh, take note of this definition because the root word of leader from the English leader, all right, one who leads, um, and the Latin duger, to draw. Next slide, please. Now, when you consider that, that definition of leadership, that it's about a responsible person who serves and influences other people to achieve a shared noble purpose, that, 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 that there's a temptation to think that leadership is only external. Leadership is just getting people along from point A to point B. But if you look at the root of the word, it's not just, you know, leader is not just to make go and to get and to show the way. The word care is actually the same root from which we get conduit. It's the same which we get education. It's to draw, to pull, to lead, to guide, to conduct. I really like that picture of to draw, to draw out. Because when you look at leadership that way, then you are drawing out the potential of the people you lead towards the purposes for which you've been called to lead. But you'd also see that leadership means that there should be a drawing out of what is within you as a leader yourself. And that's why we are talking about life story. In fact, there's a tendency to see leadership as something up there or out there. Next slide. But really from the Latin root, we just looked at to care. Leadership is a drawing out, not just of people and their potential and their purpose, but of our own selves to pull out our best leadership is to live by our life stories. Uh, where Oliver Holmes put it in a way I love. He says, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Jeff Emmelt, who took over General Electric at a point, says, leadership is one of these great journeys into your own soul. Have you ever thought about leadership that way? That's why I began to say leadership is serious business. And so today we're going to take a journey into a couple of people's life stories and see how they shift their leadership. And we're going to throw the searchlight on our own lives and ask, how can we reflect on our own life stories, reframe them so that we lead from that place of strength and familiarity, a place we've been shaped to impact the world in a unique way. Many of us are trying to learn leadership from books and trying to list out all the great characteristics of leaders, you know, and I want to talk like Obama. I want to walk like Mandela. That will not bring out your best leadership. The best leadership is going to come from your life story. Your best leadership is to lead like you. And guess what? There is nobody like you. <laughs> so, so fasten your seatbelts and let's get into this. Now, we cannot talk about life story without me telling you a couple of life stories, right? And uh, the first example I'm going to give is, is a global one, you know, uh, from the life of, of, of Howard Schultz. Many of you may know him for Starbucks, right? So I'll give you a bit of his background and why his life story has shaped Starbucks into the global company that we know today. But this, this, but I'm glad that many more Ghanaians and Africans are penning down their life stories. I want to be able to tell many, many, many of such stories that have been documented, not just an answer. Somebody told somebody that some, you know, that I heard that about this person. You know, I want to see it documented, then we can share it, you know, with confidence, right? So this week, actually, this last week, I asked Nana Red Damoa, who runs the book book store, an online bookstore, to give me a list of all the Ghanaian autobiographies he has in stock. And uh, we'll share the link with you. Uh, so that uh, you can you can go to that place and choose. These are some of them. You know, you can see some Jonas book. You can see um, uh, Dr. K. Buzia. You can see Kwame Nkrumah. You can see, and, and now, you know, uh, UT Dank, you know, uh, has written his. You know, uh, recently, George, uh, what's his name? Anda, 
It's written in, but people are, many more people are writing their biographies and autobiographies. And that, that is a wonderful thing. Now, since we live in a global context, let me start with this story of Starbucks, because you probably have heard of Starbucks, right? It's the world's largest coffee house chain. I actually have a Ghanaian friend who we met together at the University of Ghana in Lagos, a dear, dear friend of mine who works in the headquarters in Seattle. Now, Starbucks is ranked 114th on the Fortune 500 and is the 288th company on the Forbes Global 2000. Now, as of November last year, so we're just talking about seven, eight months ago, the company had 33,833 stores in 80 countries. 33,833 stores in 80 countries. Not bad, eh? Now, what if I told you that the Starbucks is basically a summary of the power of leading out of your life story. This is what Howard Schultz himself says. He says that from my earliest memories, I remember my mother saying that I could do anything I wanted in America. It was a mantra. But you see, Schultz's father had the opposite effect. He was a truck driver, he was a cab driver, he was a factory worker. He, he had about 30 different jobs he did and never earned more dollars a year. So Shoes watched his father break down while complaining bitterly about not having opportunities or respect from others. Now, this is a big thing that happened. As a teenager, Shoes clashed often with his father. He felt the stigma of his failures. He said, and I quote, he says, I was bitter about his underachievement and lack of responsibility. I thought he could have accomplished so much more if he had tried. And so Shoes was determined to escape that fate. He said, part of what has always driven me is a fear of failure. I know all too well the face of self-defeat. So feeling like an underdog, Shoes develop a determination to succeed. All right, let's go to the next, the, the, the next slide. You know, so in the first place, that's a typical, no, or maybe you, you went a step ahead. Go back to the one with the, with the Starbucks coffee. Because in the, in the first place, when, when the story of Starbucks success and how was shoes are so related that in fact, when I began to study the story, I was surprised that how shoots did not found Starbucks. He's not a founder of Starbucks. Starbucks was actually founded in 1971 by three other guys, right? Who sold his shoes in the 1980s. But but leading from his life story has absolutely shaped Starbucks into what it is today. So I give you a bit of background of how his mother thought and how his father behaved. But in the winter of 1961, Schultz was just seven years old. He was throwing snowballs with his friends outside their family apartment in New York. They didn't even have it anywhere. Actually, it was a federally subsidized building. And his mother yelled out to him from the seventh floor apartment, Howard, come inside. Dad had an accident. Now, what followed is what has shaped Schultz's life and has shaped Starbucks. He found his father in a full leg cast. He was sprawled in the living room on the, living, on, the, on the couch. What had happened was that while working as a delivery man, delivery driver, he had fallen on a sheet of ice and broken his ankle. Guess what? As a result of that, he lost his job and the family's health care benefits. Shu's mother could not go to work because she was seven months pregnant. The family had nothing to fall on. Many evenings, Shu says he had... He had his parents arguing at the dinner table about money and how much they needed to borrow. And if the telephone rang, his mother would ask him to tell the bill collectors that mommy and daddy are not home. You see, all of this was shaping him. So Shoes vowed that he would do things differently. And as you can see, the quote under, the, under, under there, he dreamed of building a company my father would be proud of. And because of this, Starbucks has been built in a way that it, it provides all its employees with healthcare benefits. He literally, I don't think he even realized that this is what the dream was going to do, but he wanted to build a company his father will be proud of. And so, if you can, if you can uh, click the, the slide again, he says, my inspiration comes from seeing my father from broken from 30 terrible blue collar jobs no that no no the slide with the graph this was a november a november slide november uh no quarter one 2021 january slide they had 32,000 stores then but by the end of last year they had 33,000 stores can you click it again you see this quote from Schultz. he says my inspiration comes from seeing my father broken 
from the 30 terrible blue collar jobs he had over his life where an educated person just did not have a shot. My friends, Starbucks is what it is today because Howard Schultz decided to build a different kind of company from his life story. I mean, employees at Starbucks are the happiest people. And this is, this is a picture from one of the stores. This was some news when they heard that they could be unionized and things like that. But if you go to the if you click again, this is another quote from Schultz. He said, that is that. That is father, his father falling ill, his father hurting himself, and then losing everything. He said, that event is directly linked to the culture and the values of Starbucks. He said, I wanted to build the kind of company my father never had a chance to work for, where you would be valued and respected no matter where you came from, the color of your skin or your level of your education. Offering healthcare was a transforming event in the equity of the Starbucks brand that created unbelievable trust with our people. We wanted to build a company that links shareholder value to the cultural values we create with our people. You see, unlike many people from humble beginnings, Schultz that is proud of his roots and he credits his life story with giving him the motivation to create one of the greatest business successes of the last 30 years. The last time I was here, I talked about leading from self out of self-awareness. The last time or the last two times, I forget. Leading from self-awareness. And I said about 18 things we need to be aware of. Our identity, our purpose, our core beliefs and worldview, our values, our emotions, all these things. One of the things I mentioned was it's important we are aware of our history, our life story. And so that is what we want to delve into, as you have heard the great example from Howard Schultz himself. And some of you maybe need a little reminder. I gave about three or four definitions the last time we met and talked about self-awareness. But let me give you this one next slide from North House, North House an Academic. He says that self-awareness is the, it, it, sorry, it reflects the personal insights of the leader. It is not an end in itself, but a process in which individuals understand themselves, including their strengths and weaknesses and the impact they have on others, and come to grips with who you really are at the deepest level. And I really love Nadim Saeed's succinct words, because like I've told you from the beginning, many of us want to read books, succeed in leadership. We want to learn methods. We want to learn philosophies. We want to copy people's styles. But self-awareness is the first chapter in the book of leadership. First, self-awareness is the first chapter in the book of, self, of, of leadership, which is why we are focusing on it tonight. Please don't run around trying to copy others. Know yourself, including your history, your life story, and leverage that to be the best leader you could ever be. And there may be, no, there may be nobody who's ever led like you, as I'll show you later on as well. And one of my friends, uh, Reverend Ikuya, um, this is a book of hers. I love it. If you haven't uh, read it, you must read it. It's one of the best written Ghanaian biographies ever. And uh, I was having a conversation with her last two weeks, two, three weeks ago. And, and she said, you know, my, my, my life and leadership are inseparable. My life story and leadership are inseparable. Of course they are inseparable. And that is the essence of what we're talking about today. So I have a course that I teach on, 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 on leading uh, from your life story. And I usually have about four uh, objectives for that course. But today, because of the time, I, I have two main objectives for this, for this uh, presentation and for this discussion. Number one, I want to reclaim leadership from this esoteric, otherworldly experience, all right, and ground it in your life story. Your best leadership is to lead like you, OK? I'm not saying leadership theory is not important. I'm saying that all of that must be in the context of your life story because there's nobody like you. And your best leadership, I'll give you about you know, a number of reasons why you must live, lead from your life story. So I want us to reclaim leadership from this out there kind of thing to let's ground it in our story. And I want to provide one tool. I think I'll give you maybe more, maybe two tools, but at least one tool to practically explore you know, your life story uh, as it pertains to how to lead uh, effectively from that place, all right? So let's do this. Um, now, some of you may know this man, J.H. Kwabankitia. He was emeritus professor. Uh, he died um, 
yeah, I think two, three years ago. He happens to be my grandfather, my mother's father. Now, I, 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 I'm bringing this up because when the New York Times, this is actually a screenshot from New York Times, when the New York Times now that he had passed away, they literally said this man, all that this man accomplished is in 97, almost 98 years, is because he led according to his life story. If you would click again, it, there's the snapshot of the article, um, and it says that, can you click it again? There's a part it focuses on that Joseph Hansen Kwablenketia was born in 1921, da, 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 but it says that he was raised by his mother and maternal grandparents after his father died, and he credits these grandparents for being his first music teachers. You see, my, my, my great-grandfather, great-grandfather died early. His father died early. This is his life story. And so he was literally raised by his grandmother, actually, because the mother actually sent him to his grandmother, who started teaching him Akan traditional songs. His grandmother, my great-grandmother, was a leader in the Adwa group, all right, featuring a female chorus and, and male dramas. Now, one person who's run, written my grandfather's biography says this, and I quote him. He says, the lived and embodied knowledge of informal education from his mother and maternal grandmother generated and sustained a lifelong interest in indigenous cultural systems while the European-based education he had provided the platform for scholarly languages, protocols, discourses, and bases at home and abroad. So you see, all of your life comes together to make you who you are. This picture you see now is, 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 is uh, my grandfather with, with Kwame Nkrumah because when Kwame Nkrumah came on and wanted to really tie us together as a nation, he knew the importance of the arts, right? And so he got my grandfather to you know, write a couple of songs and together with Ephraim Amu, they did things together. Now, the, the interesting thing is that, well, there are many interesting things. And of course, around, around that time, Ghana was emerging and so the 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 um, the they wanted to, people who were scholarly, but people who knew our culture and could, you know, knew our drum language, knew all of that, and could and could make us authentically Ghanaian, right? Now, while be, if, if Ramamu had told my grandfather while they were together at PTC, you know, at the Kropong Presbyterian Training College, that don't copy my music, <laughs> don't copy my music, so. And so, and, and was encouraging him to go back to his people, to go back to his grandmother, go back to his roots in Mampong and learn the indigenous states. And that is exactly what, what he did. And guess what? That changed everything because his grandmother, you know, taught him more. In fact, his grandmother taught him so much, he, 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 he resulted in him publishing about 100 songs. From Adwa, Adenkum, Sobom, Nyonkro, you know, Mogonmi, Asafunyom, which is war, where, you know, hunter songs, you know, war songs, you know, and, and all I'm saying is that he became what he became as a result of his life story. Shaped by his maternal grandmother. So when Professor Kofi Abrefu, Abrefa Bizia, you know, of course, he became Prime Minister later in Ghana, 1969 to 1972, but when they started, the New York Ligon had just started, and when they wanted to, they wanted, to, they started the Department of Sociology, you know, Buzia invited my grandfather to come from a Kropon to Lagos. That's how he got to Lagos. And of course, Lagos provided a great platform for him to do research, you know, and soon he was known around the world for, for his work. Why am I telling you this story? Because when he died, he got a state burial. Of course, I was there, etc. And I want us to read this thing that Professor Kwesi Ampene wrote about him. Um, professor, professor Ampene is a professor of ethnomusicology in the University of Michigan. He said that the government and people of Ghana were able to honor and keep with an impressive, and it was impressive, with an impressive state burial on 4th May 2019 is beyond our imagination. Not that he does not deserve it, but because it is unprecedented in the whole world that a musicologist is accorded the highest recognition for a civilian in any nation. Such honors may be reserved for innovators in the computer sciences, mathematics, economic sciences, and other undertakings, but for a musicologist? <laughs> 
The state burial for here in Ghana is not only indicative of his accomplishments in making the study of African musical expressions, cultural values, and traditional performance as relevant to contemporary development administration, but it is also indicative of Nketiah's success in moving African music studies from the periphery of script and national focus to the center. Do you get the cross here? My grandfather did not try to lead like anybody else. In fact, if Ramamu told him, don't lead like me, don't copy me. And because he took the, his own, own original path from his life story, instead of crying that his father had died and what will I do with my life, he took advantage of his grandmother's mothering, nurturing, and all the things that she was filled with, all those music, etc., such that the life, the leadership he provided, and later I could talk about how he was the first African director of the Institute of African Studies, and many, actually the last picture you saw is him actually with, you know, with a national award, he was, you know, even before he died. All of that leadership has come from living out his life story. That is my encouragement to you. So I want to tell you, I want to give you why you should live nine solid reasons why you should lead from your life story. Number one is that it motivates and inspires you to lead. You think that how shoes wakes up in the morning and wonders, ah, uh, will I go to work today? No, he wants to work in a company his father will be proud of. He gets up and says, let's do this. Let's provide more health care for our people, etc." I remember when my grandfather was still alive, you know, even throughout his 90s, he died at 97, even throughout his 90s, every day he would wake up early in the morning. He would wash up, he would dress up, he would go, he had an office at the African study on the university campus because he was an emeritus professor. I mean, like, I was like, Grandpa, what keeps you going? He says, well, I just get up and I go. <laughs> you know, you, when you lead from your lifestyle, it motivates, motivates and inspires you to lead, right? Number two, it provides the passion and the purpose for your leadership. It is just the perfect combination of the content, the context, and the characteristics to be a great leader. All right, let me say this here. The greatest factor for successful and significant leadership is not being born a leader. That is a theory of 200 years ago. It's been debunked. Or having particular characteristics, traits, or styles of leadership. No. Or even trying to emulate great leaders. No. The greatest combination of things you need to be a great leader is to leverage your own unique life story. Mandela will not be Mandela without Robin Island. <laughs> you know, he wasn't trying to be a Gandhi. No, he leveraged his life story. All right. I hope I hope this is really, really clear for us. All right. Of course, when you lead according to your life story, it makes you an authentic leader. That's the fourth point there. All right. So that you lead out of your true self, not your false shell, or your false self or shadow self. Number five, when you lead out of your life story, it ensures that there's no personal or peer or public pressure. And you also have sustainable leadership, leadership success. And number six, it provides the dedication and the commitment you need to lead well and excel at it. The seventh reason I'll give you, by the way, this are these have come from many, many things I've researched, and you will not find this anywhere. It's not like some book that you get these points on there. Um, number seven, it shapes your leadership philosophy. The best, the best leadership school is life itself, and the best labos is your life story. So when you lead out of life, it shapes your leadership philosophy. And then number eight, it gives you a true north for your life and leadership. Because from your life story, you pick your values. Right? You pick the principles of life from that. And finally, you know, when you lead from your life story, it significantly lessens the risk of leadership burnout. There are many, many people burning out in leadership because they are not leading from their life story. They are trying to be like someone else. They are trying to be something else. And I want to read this quote from Parker Palmer because he says very clearly what burnout actually is. Many of us think burnout is, I work so hard and I'm tired. And maybe, yes, there's that kind of burnout. But he says that when you give something you do not possess, he says, when I give something I do not possess, I give a false and dangerous gift. It's a gift that looks like love, but in reality is loveless. It's a gift given more from my need to prove myself that from the others need to be cared for. Leadership is your leadership about truly caring for people, serving and influencing people towards a shared noble purpose, or really it's about proof self. Parker Papa says, one sign that you are violating your own nature in the name of nobility, in the name of leadership, is a condition called burnout. Though usually regarded as the result of trying to give too much, burnout, in my experience, results from trying to give 
what I do not possess. If you try to give what you do not possess, you will burn out. This is the ultimate in giving too little. Burnout is a state of emptiness. It's to be, to be sure, but it does not result from giving all I have. No, it merely reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the first place. End of quote. So this is my recommendation to you. This, I call the Perby Pathway. I have to pick this from different places and put this together. This is how to become a great leader by living out of and leveraging your life story. Number one, reflection. You can see on this diagram there's introspection, deep reflection. Make some time for serious solitude. Be alone with yourself and your God, your creator. Deeply reflect to understand how the important people and the events in your life have shaped your life, have shaped your approach to the world. And then rope in others. That's the feedback. So for yourself is introspection. For others, from others is feedback. Rope in your life partner, rope in your parents, your siblings, your friends, coaches, therapists, counselors. Rope in people who may give you feedback. All right? Somebody may tell you a story. And sana yeba wono. Papa be the catch your woman missing. Ube, you know, prophecy, all of that is part of where we must look for our life story, our leadership. All right? And then also say, rope in some tools. And I'm going to share a couple of tools with you shortly. But when you have first uh, reflected, number two, rope in others. All right? So you have feedback and get tools to help you with both. I think number three is to reconcile your under, your story, all right? So you need self-understanding. You can see that there are all these steps. You need self-compassion. All of these things towards this self-realization so, so that you have success and significance. When in the reconciling of your story, embrace all of your life story. You know, don't try and polish it. In fact, I love uh, one preacher I had said that God takes your mess and makes it a mess sage, all right? There are some people with that, without their mess, they won't even be known in the world, all right? So don't try to bury your past or, or mask it. It's all part of your life story, and God will use all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all right? So reflect, rope in others, rope in tools, number three, reconcile the entire story, all right? But this is the most important part, is literally the lever. Reframe your story. Learn to reframe, especially the negative aspects of your story. Reframe it in a way that makes you to leverage it. Robin Island, for all these years, get what? Man reframes it. Gandhi, you know, suffers, you know, discrimination in South Africa as a lawyer. Gets that governizes him. He says, I'm going to India. Something has changed, you know, with the way the British treat our people. Reframe. The, 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 let me quote Bill George. Uh, he has an amazing book called uh, True North. You know, if, if uh, you've never read it, it's a book you want to read. He says, the difference with authentic leaders lies in the way they frame their stories. Reframing our stories enables us to recognize that we are not victims at all, but people shaped by experiences that provide the impetus to become leaders. Our life stories evolve constantly as we shape the meaning of our past present, and future, end of quote. So remember that. Reflect, rope in, reconcile, reframe your story, and then run your life and leadership from the premise and the power of your life story. Authentically leveraging your life story for impact. Paradoxically, to run life leadership way, all right, to run is to ground it. That's the paradox there, is to ground your leadership in your life story. This is one of the tools that you can use. It's called a uh, timeline. All right. Now, this particular one is designed, was designed uh, by um, uh, Bobby Clinton, who's done a lot of research. He's, he's, he, he, I think he, he's researched on five leaders, you know, historical, biblical, contemporary leaders. And he's seen that they're about, he, 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 this particular one, he talks about it in terms of ministry, but you can remove the word ministry and put leadership there. All right. Or even put service there because service is leaders, leadership is service. So you can say your leadership timeline. You know, you know, the first 20 years is, is the sovereign foundations. A lot of things you don't even determine, right? But God telling who you, where you'll be born, who you'll be born to, you know, any of the negative things that happen, like Oprah. Oprah is who she is, and I'm not saying it's never a good thing to be abused, you know, but Oprah has been able to reframe that abuse story and has become the Oprah that she is today. 
The first 20 years or so of your life is a sovereign foundation. And then the next three to six years, try to transition into leadership. All right. Phase two of your life from the ministry foundations or the leadership foundations is the growth leadership, leadership growth. All right. The first five to 10 years, you're just learning to, to lead. You know, many of you don't realize that your best leadership is actually now going to start. Now that you are in your 40s. All right. That, that's where competent leadership actually begins. Mostly in your 40s. But life does not begin at 40, but it certainly takes on a different level altogether from your 40s. All right. Right up to, you know, where you have, in, in, especially in your 40s, 50s, you have now realized what you're good at, what you're not good at. Hopefully, you reflected enough on your life story to know how best you are to lead. All right. And come finally to a place, you know, probably in your 60s, 70s, where there's convergence, where everything in your life has come together and it's like, you are giving wisdom back to, to the world. So we can share the, this. You can actually design this. Can you show the next slide? It's basically a, 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 a following that timeline, but draw, you can draw, you know, a, 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 a chart, all right, a table, and just reflect on the things that are happen, happening in your first 20 years. And then from age 20 to 30, some of you, that's where you're going to end. Some of us 30 to 40 because that's how old we are. Some of us 40 to 50. If you're about 60, you have got to look at that as well. And then look at the critical incidents that have happened in your life. The people, the events, and the experiences that have had the greatest impact on your life and leadership and how all of this has shaped you. All right. So let me ask you some questions that some of the questions you can think about uh, when you do this exercise. Where in your life story, which experiences have you found the greatest inspiration and passion for your leadership? Can you connect the dots between your past and your future to find the inspiration to lead authentically? What have been the key turning points in your life? I mean, for me, for example, that accident in Cote d'Ivoire was a key turning point in my life. All right. Uh, so the, I see you are on, on the next slide already. You find that shows the, the critical incidents. So think about these things. Yes. What have been the, do the failures or disappointments you've experienced in your life constrain you? Or have you been able to reframe them as learning experiences? These are things you cannot do in a hurry. I'm just pointing them to you to make time later on and go through. All right. So that, that next slide there shows you how uh, this is from Bill, 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 Bill George's book, the one I just showed you, True North. And he also divides life into three phases. There's a preparing for leadership 0 to 30, 30 to 60 is leading. And many things, there are ups and downs in that. There are down times, what he calls crucibles. We all go through those fires, those tests. And then because this generativity from 60 going, you are not done, man. Think about it. Ken Sanders started Kentucky Fried Chicken when he was 66. Who told you your best life is over before retirement? No. In fact, Bobby Clinton in his work in the leadership emergence theory, he showed that God develops a leader over the entire course of their lives. So the other tools that can help you, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, if you've never done the disc, please, let's do that. All right? Let's talk to Sam or talk to myself and let's help you. It's one of the tools, as you draw your leadership lifeline, the, the, a disc, for example, also shows you how you are shaped. Please click it again, you know, and, 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 and so that you know what kind of leadership style that you have been wired for. Please, please click it, click it again so they can see that's right. Whether you are the, the you have, you've been given the dominant driver style or the influencing style, the sanguines or the steady styles or the compliant styles, you lead differently based on how you've been wired. Let's share with you that I myself have... Start, I've led in the way I have because of my life story. Um, recently, I started, I started a, a new company, uh, Training Leaders, because I looked at my life story and said, training executive leaders. So I've always trained leaders. I mean, you see me wearing the hat group. It's, we've been training leaders for next year, will be 20 years. And now we have worked in 25 countries on all six continents. You know, we have always been like that. I saw early in my life that God had given, that I wasn't just talented in particular things, because I sing, I play the piano, I, I do some of everything. And I realized that my gift really was leadership. You know, so I started teaching leadership. And of course, there was a big need for it in Ghana. There still is. And so I lead through the hard group, etc. But I realized that my recent, like my last 
12, 15 years of life having a significant executive positions, all right? Like in the military, like you saw from that picture earlier on, like leading cross-culturally, like that picture you saw earlier on as well. I mean, if you look at the people on this picture, this cross-cultural thing, you know, there's a white lady from Canada, born and bred in Canada, but there's a guy from, from China, somebody who's Dutch but raised in Brazil. You know, there's a guy from, you know, uh, where's, where's he from? Uh, Colombia. I went to Colombia to recruit him to Canada. There's a lady on the bottom left from Singapore. And the one in the middle is, is a mix of China, Hong Kong, and, and Thailand. The, the lady the lady on the bottom right is from Vietnam, you know, went to MIT. I like, and so I've been given all these gifts of cross-cultural leadership, et cetera. And so now I'm bringing it to bear in the corporate space. So I decided to start an executive education business, you know, that does executive coaching, leadership development, management training, corporate consulting, just like Sam is doing. All right. And so we offer coaching and can you click that, that slide and so that we can get past it? coaching and assessments and authoring and speaking and training again because i sat down looked at my last actually i was on sabbatical i had taken a, a, a break from work as a president of international student ministries canada taking a break from work as a pundit i said no i have god has given me such high level leadership i've been a military captain i've i've, I've been an, 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 an officer you know senior officer in, in UN peacekeeping. I've been a CEO of a Canadian company. Man, I need to bring this to bear, you know, on executive leadership. So we have a vision to create authentic leaders, which is why I'm talking about leading from your life story. We want to see a global ecosystem of authentic leaders who are characterized by healthy growth, holistic success, and lasting significance. And, that's, and so even in our offerings, we make sure that our relationships and resources that we offer are customized. Because no two people have the same life story. As I bring this thing to a conclusion, some of you know that recently I, I, I launched the book, Africa to the Rest. And again, you will be surprised how much of my life story prepared me to write this book. I'm going to tell you all of it. But you remember I told you about my grandfather. Well, my grandfather is an academician, was an academician. And his, his, his remarkable book that was a turnaround in the world was called The Music of Africa written in the 70s. My mother also is an academic from my grandfather. And guess what? She wrote mainly about the history, the slave history of Africa. And as I reflected on my life, I realized that, wow, music of Africa, my grandfather, history of Africa, my mother. And I realized that God had called me to lead in the missiology of Africa. There's no medical doctor that I know who's like me. <laughs> so I cannot look at the best medical doctor and say, this is how I want to lead life. There's no medical doctor I know who's a missiologist. There's no medical doctor I know who runs an executive training company like the one I do. I don't know many medical doctors who have been pastors of a Chinese church, have a unique life story. And the reason, the way to lead in a way that is stress-free and most impact, I'm inspired, I'm empowered, and I make my mark on the world is by living my, living, leading through my unique life story. So as we conclude, I'd like to remind you that don't lead from a book. You are a book. This is the latest exhortation I give people. All right. Uh, one of the quotes that we gave before, which, as we invited you to this course, was people are like books. The cover might give you a clue regarding the story inside, but if you don't open the book, two stories are lost. Emily Gordon said, your life story is a gift and it should be treated as such. Don't lead from a book. You are a book. And these days, and of course, when I say, and, you know, I'm, I'm saying don't just lead from other people's, learn from other people's books. Yes, of course, read the 21 laws of leadership. Yes, etc. But none of those books is as important as your life as a book. The only other book that will be most important, apart from your life book, is the book called the Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. God said to Joshua, a leader who was about to lead out of his life story. Don't let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. And be careful to do everything written in it. He says, then you'll be prosperous and successful. Don't forget that God's word, the Bible, is a mirror. And we can look at things in there, including our life story. 
and lead from a place of authenticity. The best leadership school is life itself. And the best syllabus is your life. Especially when it's created, connected to the God story, the grand narrative of what God is seeking to do in the world. My friends, the essence and power of leading from life story is one of the things that makes leadership such a personal thing. Leadership is a very personal, it's, it, it's about the person of the leader. And just as you conclude one portion of your journey, you meet another opportunity, another part of your journey emerges, all right? And you can what you've learned from one, one phase of your life to apply to the new situation. We need to embrace the entirety of our life story and learn the lessons and leverage those lessons to lead and impact the world in a unique way that, that no one else has and no one else can. What a fascinating paradox that the outward journey of serving and influencing others actually begins with a leader's own, a leader's own journey inwards and backwards, drawing from the power of their own life story. Thank you very much for listening to me and I'm excited, eager to hear the questions and comments and contributions that follow. Wow. I just, I was just glued to just listen to the doc and um, sharing all those stories. And it's really, really, really amazing, amazing, amazing uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, doc. And um, we would just come back quickly and see the questions and the comments that, uh, that we have. Uh, I don't know if Kofi is there, but uh, uh, for... Uh, those of you who are interested in joining the leadership uh, journey, the growth journey, um, well, the next cohort, we are so many people, so we are doing two cohorts at the same time. Um, so we still have room for, for uh, a fifth cohort. So the fourth and the fifth are running concurrently. So we have some more room. More than 15 people have joined, so we need to uh, open another one. So we still encourage uh, those of you who have not registered for the leadership uh, growth journey. We are having um, the fourth cohort is starting next week on the 7th. And we are starting another one on the 8th if we have enough numbers. But we have more than 15 already. So we are, we are breaking that into two. So please take advantage. Don't miss the boat. Uh, this time, they say both of two coaches running concurrently, great learnings uh, where you can also draw some ideas to build on your life story as we've been told. Thank you so much, Doc, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. All right. Um, okay, let's see who is in the house. Um, I have... Uh, Christopher says, good evening. Joining from Koforidia, thank you. Uh, Rose Odai is here, and uh, I can't wait. Uh, you've heard doctor. Uh, Douglas says, good evening. Uh, greetings from Accra. That is uh, total life changes. Amolante is here. Consta, uh, Reverend Constance is here. Chasni Odotoe Odoe from Banju is here. Thank you so much, Charles. Dennis Ahe, good evening, joining once again. Thank you. Kwame JB, thank you so much from the UK. Isaac Jangba, thank you so much from Tema. Thank you. Natalie Kwajui is here. Uh, says hi, team. And uh, Really, uh, we have Martin at uh, Cofrando is from Asimfosu is here. All right. I have Lakwe says, I first listened to Dr. Pebby about 20 years ago while uh, I was in secondary school. Wow, that's great. And uh, Dr. That is uh, Lakwe says, 20 years ago, when you come, you probably see if you can recognize 
she just finished the growth journey and uh, she's excited. Um, it's such a delight to listen to you today, doctor. I'm very impressed that you are able to homeschool six kids. I find that my kids are exceptional when we study together. It's my dream to homeschool them, but not sure how to work around my current schedule effectively to their benefit. I'm an architect and a mother of three preschool kids. All right. So, Doc, uh, life story, you're going to share some of it. <laughs> Are you able to, to school six kids with all this global leadership you're doing? I mean, this is just amazing. Um, Ebenezer Tufor Yabua says, don't lead from the book. Uh, you are a, don't lead from the book. You are a book. Thank you for this insightful and inspirational lecture. I am inspired. All right. Okay. Natalia says, leadership by a life story is the best. Dominic says, hello. Emmanuel Adipa Adapo says, great. And uh, Natalia says, what happens when leadership uh, are chosen based on the physicals? All right. So I don't see any questions. All right. Kofi, let's see if you can share the promo and then we'll get Doc to see if he's going to comment on any of these things. I have a few questions. I know Sarah has a few. So um all right so Kofi, over to you hello everyone my name is elsie and i'm excited that i just completed a 15-week journey with the ctl africa team on the 15 laws of invaluable growth by john c maxwell from the law of pain i also learned that every problem introduces a person to himself honestly so you face a problem you wouldn't know the, the the things that you actually have within you the journey for me personally was a wake-up call before i joined this journey i wasn't actually learning at all i wasn't adding any logic to my what i need. so the law of trade-off is saying that you have to give up to, to grow up so things that I think are not going to have, ne uh, you know, maximum impact on my life, I have to trade them off. I want to grow. I am not stopping now. I am continuing. And as far as I'm concerned, like it says, you cannot give what you don't have. I definitely will have to give what I have learned off to others and then get more so that I can continue giving. I am not going to be a reservoir. I am going to be a river. And therefore, I'm going to continue learning to be able to give off my best. Ordinary people can achieve extraordinary results on a consistent basis if they have a system, if they have a plan. All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, so um, Sarah, I don't know if you have any question for Doc, but there are two comments that uh, maybe Doc will want to comment on. Lakwe, who heard you 20 years ago, is trying to homeschool three kids and he doesn't understand how you homeschool six. Uh, as part of your life story, maybe you want to share. Uh, I think Natalie talked about people chosen from their physicals. But um, so uh, let's, uh, let's hear Doc if he has any uh, comments yeah. on those. Uh, to comment and then Sarah will bring you in to see if you have some questions for Doc. Okay, All right. Doc. Yes, that was that was a very interesting question uh, about the about the homeschooling. Obviously, we're actually helping our children shape their own life, and they're also going to have a unique life story, right? I wasn't homeschooled, but they are getting homeschooled, and they will have uh, their own story to tell. So. What, what I'll say is that uh, vision is the most important thing. If you have this vision uh, and you're serious enough about it, then the question is, what's the strategy? What am, how am I going to go about making this happen? And it will take some sacrifices. So for example, while I have spent many global roles, 
we decided that we'll do the kinds of businesses that would enable us to to be able to be around to be home you know so my wife you know i do some of the homeschooling but mostly she does and so she's picked all oh, she's an economist she's an entrepreneur she, I mean, she has a master's in economics and everything rather than go and work for the bank of you know royal bank of canada or bank of ghana or whatever we said no i'm going to i'm going to work from home you know so that's one of the things you've got to think about if you want to continue your architecture then if you cannot chase every project right you have to decide all right i'm going to take x number of projects i'm not going to do this i'm going to do that i can't do this because my emphasis now is my children and of course there's a lot of teamwork as well right you know so what i can do she does what, what she can do i do uh and so to, and so together um you would be able you would find a way so for example when it comes to the finances it's not all the time both parents need to work to make an income in fact uh, a lot of double income homes in our time uh, a lot of double income homes don't have to be double income homes a lot of homes can live on the income of not everyone uh, you know I, I recognize that can live on the income of one person so then why don't you do that so that the other person is free to mainly do the homeschooling it's a, it's a phenomenal thing so our oldest now um our oldest our oldest has now gone to to high school right so we, we have seven children now sam you have to update your your uh, your 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 bio we have seven children and so the oldest since we, we've been in ghana since august uh we are transitioning to be able to live both in ghana and canada and so the oldest is now in high school uh, ghana christian high and so we still have six at home but when we come to ghana uh, because we have other responsibilities and other interests, especially entrepreneurial interests, we hire homeschool teachers to work with us. So in Ghana, we have hired somebody to work with the older three children and then the younger three children as well. We can talk some more later on about why we started and uh, what we do. And again, homeschooling gives us the freedom to use quite a number of different syllabi. So we don't just use uh, you know, the Canadian system or Ghana education system. But for example, when it comes to math, we use Singapore math. Nobody is better at math than the Singaporeans. They have a unique method which makes you really grasp the fundamentals. So yes, we are shaping our children's life story. And uh, it comes from a certain experience we had in Canada and decided that we we're going to homeschool. But the point I'm making is that we need to make real sacrifices if we're serious about the visions that we claim uh, to have in our hearts yes um, all right then. yes so, uh, thank you so much for sharing that um the 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 point you made about reframing your story doc yes um i think is that not where we have the issues where yes you know how do you reframe the story to be positive i mean mm. you, you, you you a lot of us have I mean, I, I, I mean, I love you the way you've been, and I, I, I like to trace back my village. And when I tell stories about my village and people mm, are saying, mm. no, you're no more in the village. I said, no, 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 I'm mm, no more mm. in the village. I'm not still no more in the village, but I should know where I came from because that has influenced who I am. And okay. I don't have to forget it. But a lot of us want to, want to, want people not to know where we came from. If I had a cousin, yeah. When we when we close, uh, we 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 are on the we are in the same secondary school. Yeah. When we vacate, we all go back to the village. As a secondary school, we all go back to the village. But when we come back to school, he tells everybody he went to London. Oh. I'm wow. the only one who know we were all in the farms, we were all in the village, and he's telling stories about London, about the Queen, and about this and mm. so so <laughs> you know. And there's so many people who want to tell a different story from what their true story is. How That's does right. this affect our influence? And mm. how do we really reframe, you know, especially mm. the negative stories in our lives yeah. and draw the positive from it, Doc? Yeah. That, that's a brilliant question, uh, Sam. And uh, it, I think somebody has told us that negative stories uh, or, or humble beginnings or things that we are ashamed, you know, ashamed about and all of that don't sell. Uh, but but that's, that's not true at all. If, if, you, if, if you look, if you, I mean, I didn't have the time to go into 
so many other examples, but you would realize that there are, in fact, in fact, both examples I gave you tonight, those, the, the main examples I even gave tonight, all because people rethink their story. Reverend, Reverend uh, 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 for example, if you read her story, this is a, a woman who, right from, you know, going to school, middle class family and everything, you know, from primary school, secondary school, university, had a challenge with approval. Always wanting approval from people, you know, and and she shares. In fact, this is the best Ghanaian biography I've read because she's very, very honest, you know. And she, she so, but she's been able to share that and been able to reframe that. Howard shoots, you know, yes, because of his father's experience, reframe that. My grandfather could have been complaining, and I'm in Papa Wu, and I'm even no, but took advantage of his reframe of 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 of, of, the, of the upbringing that his maternal grandma, you know, gave him, and guess what? became a well-renowned scholar, all right? So we should not be ashamed of any part of our stories. In fact, the challenge is when we do and we try to block these things, we have emptiness. Not only is there a thickness about our leadership, there's also an emptiness about our lives. Um, or, there's one coaching client that I that I had, top, top, top business person, you know. But when we met, my goodness, this person was just empty, telling me about how empty. And I'm like, look, you have the latest cars, you have the biggest houses, you know, a lot of that, but empty, feeling so empty. And in our coaching, we realized that this person had blogged a significant part of her life story. Didn't want to know, didn't want to remember, certainly didn't want anybody to know. And guess what? Although she had all these external things, she felt empty and something wasn't clicking in life. Now she has a new lead on life. I mean, it's, oh my goodness. You, you, and now this person actually wants to write a book and I might co-write it with, with this person, with this leader. This is a single leader. I don't want to mention, you know, because she's a very well-known leader. And, uh, and now this person wants to write a book to help other people to cure this self-doubt and this hiding of parts of our stories because you can get as rich as she is and have as high positions as you hear she, she has and still have and still be very empty. All right. But the question is how do we reframe? You know, I think it starts with the mentality that no matter what, uh, what bad things happen in life, good things can come out of bad things. I want to encourage people to read a lot of biographies. Because when you read biographies, they encourage you, they let you realize, oh, what I'm going through is not strange. Somebody even went through worse, but look at what came out of it. All right? It starts with that mindset that the fact that something starts bad or the fact that something was wrong, the fact that it did something shameful, etc., does not mean the end has to be that way. Right, the end of the matter is better than the beginning thereof. It starts with that mentality that I can take this and reshape it into a different kind of future. But I also think that it, we need people in our lives who will help us on that journey. And I did mention that in the, in the reframe, we need to rope in people. You know? And so I really encourage anybody who is struggling to reframe a painful experience. Um, it could be teenage pregnancy. It could even be rape. And God forbid, like I said, God forbid that it happens to any of us or our children or anything like that. But even if something as horrible as that happens, there's a way to heal, you know, with, with counseling, with therapy and all. There's a way to heal and to even reframe that. You know, one of my friends who got pregnant um, when, when she was in secondary school, you know, be, became a big time counselor because of that, because of that life story. You know, she was able to reframe that. And that became the, the impetus from which she, 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 she lived. So if you're not able to, so first is mindset. And I'll say that, you know, secondly, uh, uh, get, get help. Get somebody who can provide perspective and help you to see how this can be turned around for good. Nelson Mandela could have become a very bitter man. All right? Very, very bitter man. In fact, the people, many people around him were more bitter on his behalf than he himself. But he decided, I'll be better, not bitter. Same thing with Joseph. Joseph totally reframed. I mean, the anchor 
you know the story of Joseph, sold by your own brothers, or you know, into slavery and all that he went through. But look at how Joseph reframed the story. He said, "Yeah, you guys did this. I don't hold anything to be against you because what you meant for evil, God turned around for good, including the saving of the whole world in this global food crisis." All right. So that that's what I'll I'll share uh, about the importance of and how to reframe our stories. Great. Awesome. Thank you, um, Doc. And as I was listening to you, there's a program that I did a few years ago, and uh, it did talk, it talk about these reframing, that you should see it from the same perspective, in the sense mm -hmm. that um, there are three gifts. Life is three gifts. Whatever happens to you is three gifts. It's the gift that you learn from it, you gain the knowledge, and then secondly, you gain the power to really determine the choices that you're going to make. And lastly, to get inspiration, just like uh, the, um, the owner of Starbucks did. It was bad, but that really inspired. However, some of us are not that strong in mind. How can we develop that strength, mm -hmm. mental strength, to be able to move? Mm, mm. Yeah, and like 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 I said, I've found that biographies help a lot. You know, become a dealer in biographies because you know information brings transformation, right? I also encourage people to get into scripture. You know, scripture, even the whole thing people Christians call the gospel, is because there was a reframing of death. You know, death, which was supposed to be the, the final blow and our defeat and all of that, it was a resurrection, you know. So scripture, is the gospel is powerful in helping transform our minds and saying that, whoa, out of death can come life, you know, out of, of, of rottenness can come, can come uh, um, yes, can come life. I will, and both Sarah, both you and I, uh, and of course some as well, are coaches, uh, for those who may not be mentally strong, you know, even though you're reading biographies, you're trying to reframe, you're reading the scriptures, like I said earlier, and I want to repeat it, get a coach. Get a coach. We, we underestimate that in, in, in Africa a lot. And I thank God for the people like you who are working to make it appreciated. A coach will help you work through this. this just like a physical trainer, will help you work. This morning, I had met with my physical trainer and, uh, you know, helping me to get in shape physically. You know, the same way I meant a coach to help you with the mental exercises, you know, and the, 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 the strategies and the tricks and, the, and the, the tools, you know, to grow that mental fortitude to be able to reframe your story. And sometimes you may need more than a coach. Um, you may actually need a therapist to help you go through these things, acknowledge the things you need to acknowledge, grieve where you need to grieve, you know, and so and then be able to reframe it. So um, get people who will come alongside you, even if it's paying for professional help, it will be worth it when you're able to leverage that story. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, um, there was, uh, we almost missed Natalia's question uh, on what happens when people are leaders are chosen from the physicals. I don't know if you if you mm. get that. And I think yeah. that's the only question. Then I have uh, Collins saying that great presentation and insight shared. I recall him speak to us in Achimota School, Agri House, when he came to speak to us as freshers. So, Doc, a lot of people recalling you speaking to them that is the influence you're having thank you so much um yeah. all right yeah Good. so that's what um, you mentioned choosing leaders according to physicals um yes in, in some cases that like, leadership is really contextual because in some cases physicals matter right mm -hmm. i mean in, for, for certain jobs for example you know uh etc but ultimately if we do not choose according to internal qualities, you know, and then lead from our stories, it will not be authentic leadership. Yeah. You remember the quotes that we shared from Paco Palma? You know, you'll be amazed how many leaders are stressed 
because they will choose because no effect. You know, he's fair colored or he's tall or whatever, and does not actually have the aptitude and the competence, you know, the skills to do the leadership or even the character to do the thing that they are supposed to do. Many leaders are stressed. You probably have heard of imposter syndrome. And, you know, it's not, it's not just those who are qualified who are having imposter syndrome and so we are helping them through. No, some people are truly not qualified, you know. <laughs> so uh, if, if, if you want, don't want to lead out of it, don't, don't want to shorten your life by, by uh, because you, are not, you don't have what it takes, you know, for a particular kind of leadership, then don't 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 let people just use physical to choose you. Actually, be worth your salt, you know, and know that you have the competences, the character, the compassion, the what you need to lead in that situation, and that you are again leading out of the power of your of your life story. So, in some rare situations, physicals are important, but most most of the time, my leadership is not a physical thing. Is a mind and heart and soul thing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for the young ones who are choosing partners, physicals, let's beware. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> All right. So I don't see any more questions and uh, comments coming through. So I just want to thank Doc and uh, and thank all of you and ask Doc to give us his final closing thoughts and. Uh, and, and, and take away. Thank you so yeah. much, Doc. Well, I, I want to believe we are not getting too many uh, questions and comments. But I, I would hope that it's because people are actually really thinking, you know, about these things. And honestly, these are things that unfortunately we don't hear a lot about. Absolutely. But we are moving into a place and space in the world right now where authentic leadership is the thing, especially after the global dot com crisis the, the after Anderson Enron you know and then the global economic crisis of 2008 and actually for Ghana we had our own banking crisis my goodness it wasn't just political and there was a real crisis my friends there was a real crisis all right and of course there are people that have been found culpable people that must be tried and all of that but be that as it may we are really calling for authentic. Can't you see the country is calling for authentic leadership? Our generation is crying for authentic leadership. And one, this is not the only, but one major, major way to lead authentically is to know your life story and lead from that place. Nobody else is shaped like you. They may have your spiritual gifts, they may not have your talents. They may have your talents, they will not have your temperament. They may have your temperament and your talent. They will certainly not have your life story. And so please find the way that God has uniquely shaped you. And there may be nobody, you may be the first to go that route. Now people want to be like Mandela, but Mandela had no Mandela to be like. People want to be like Gandhi. Gandhi had no Gandhi to look up to to be like. All right. But Luther King did not have, you know, a, 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 a prototype to say that I want to. Of course, he had mentors like Gandhi. You know, so it's good to have mentors, etc. But there's nobody like you. Nobody can do you like you. And so I really want to encourage them. And again, many of us are not reflective enough. And the first step I mentioned to leading authentically is actual reflection, deep reflection. Many of us are spending so much time in traffic, going to work, so much time in traffic, coming back, and make time for solitude, quietness, just you and your God, you and yourself. Sit yourself on a chair. Make time for reflection. And as you deeply reflect about your life story, you have all these insights and the things that you need to reframe to be able to leverage your story. And you would you you will impact the world in a great and unique way, not because you copied somebody, but because you found your unique life story, reframed it, leveraged it, and made a mark, made a dent in the universe. So cheers to authentic leadership coming from your life story thank you so much it's absolutely absolutely important that uh, we lead and impact the world from our own life stories and thank you so much doc for those beautiful beautiful stories and lessons and tools that you have so freely shared with us we appreciate you thank you so much 
God bless you, may God bless your leadership and expand your influence. You've already covered the world, all the continents, but maybe <laughs> deepened uh, yeah. in a special way. Uh, thank you so much, Doc. And thank you, Abigail, for uh, supporting. Thank you, Kofi. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, the rest of the team, uh, for your support. And to all of you who joined us this evening, I want to say thank you uh, that you always make the time. And those of you who did not even uh, announce yourself, we know that many, many of you connect every Saturday without necessarily commenting or introducing yourself. And we want to thank you until next week where we come your way again with another leader and another great topic. We say have a very good night. Uh, let's go to church tomorrow. Thank God for our lives. Good night. God bless you. Bye-bye. Navigating through life without a coach or a guide can be very deceiving, making you come to think that you have achieved the highest or the best you can ever, or you have made the best of decisions. But until you become very intentional and take a good stock of your life, you would not realize that it's a mistake. Pain helps you to come out of your comfort zone. Uh, the law of intentionality and the fact that learning is a lifelong journey if you want to be significant. Emphasis on significance. Previously, I used to be very unintentional about the things I do when it comes to my family, my work, my Christian life and basically everything that I do. In the pursuit of that growth, there are gaps. There are gaps that we need to conquer. These gaps include the knowledge, perfection, mistake, inspirational, timing, and assumption gap. And I will encourage you to be part of CTL Africa's 15-week growth journey. I encourage you all out there who need to live their life to be part of CTL Africa's growth journey. Please take advantage of this program and your life will never be the same. Thank you very much, CTL Africa, and continue to impact the world. God bless.